Before I begin, I would like to thank Professor Raz Yosef and the staff at the Tisch School for inviting me to chair this event. And thanks to Diana for her assistance. This is a wonderful opportunity to welcome my dear friend, uh, Professor Janet Walker. Our path first crossed because we both write about trauma. However, her influence on my work also has to do with the fact that the first time I read a chapter about Cambodian cinema, a subject to which I dedicated my last book, was in the anthology documentary Testimonies, Global Archives of Suffering that Professor Walker co-edited with Bhaskar Sarkar. So I have the pleasure and honor of hosting our distinguished guest, Professor Janet Walker, whom I will soon introduce. After her talk, we will open the floor for discussion. Janet Walker is professor and former chair of Film and Media Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and an affiliate of the Department of Feminist Studies and the Comparative Literature Program, with specialization in documentary film, trauma studies, and media environment. Her books include Trauma Cinema, Documenting Incest and the Holocaust from 2005, Documenting testi Documentary Testimonies, Global Archives of Suffering from 2010, and Sustainable Media, Critical Approaches to Media and Environment, co-edited with Nicole Starosilski, is this okay? Yeah, from 2016. Articles drawn from her current project on mapping and environmental justice appear and are accessible online in the journals Media Fields and Nexus. She is co founder of the online open access University of California Press Journal Media Plus Environment. The title of her talk today is In Human Geographies El Mar, La Mar, and Other Situations of the Mediatic Anthropocene. Please, Janet. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Morad Raya, for that really <laughs> generous introduction and I should also say that the that the scholarly influence as well as the friendship is mutual I've learned so much from your work thank you and I'm really happy to be here and I also want to thank the series committee professors Yosef Hagen Landesman and the wonderful coordinator Diana Gals Young thank you uh, for for this great opportunity to talk with you and I am really looking forward to the the discussion portion of the uh, this, this, I guess this afternoon or evening, or for me, breakfast talk. Uh, I'm speaking to you from across the world and nearby the University of California, Santa Barbara. Like many universities in the United States that have boosted their status as land grant universities. This one was founded on the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples and specifically on the lands, villages, and unceded territories of the Chumash nation. I hereby acknowledge Chumash peoples, their elders, past and present, as well as their future generations. And since this is a scholarly gathering, the significance of Native American people's place and the place of traditional ecological knowledge in the learning and research activities of this university. Okay, I'm doing a little more of this. Okay, moving things around here. Fog and dirt, violence and magic have surrounded the tracing and institution of borders since late antiquity. This is the evocative first line of the critical migration study, border as method, and it signals the author's intent to grapple with the proliferation of borders and border struggles so over against the neoliberal pretense of free flowing markets. And with this figure of the border or borderscape or zone as painfully material and yet also symbolic, motile and multi-scalar. A main point of the book is to demonstrate the forces of constraint and violation in specific liminal areas and to emphasize the contestation of the border 
practiced daily by these subjects in transit. The Sonoran Desert has been turned into a corridor, but people pass along vulnerable to attack and at risk of their lives. This is the North American hot desert eco region of 100,000 square miles, known for its extreme high temperatures and aridity, and then too for summer thunderstorms and frigid temperatures in the desert subalpine valleys and high mountains. In 1994, the US Border Patrol established a strategy known as prevention through violence. I mean, <laughs> yes, I, I, that was a Freudian slip. It's known as prevention through deterrence. The concept was to pinch off access points in populated areas such as El Paso, Texas, or San Diego, California, so as to deter or force would-be migrants from Mexico and Central and South America through more hostile terrain, less suited for crossing and more suited to enforcement. But since being deterred isn't an option for many people seeking to thrive, prevention through deterrence and its successive contortions have brought into being a space of violence and loss. Concentrating on the large number of migrant deaths from dehydration and exposure, anthropo anthropologist Jason de Leon writes that this strategic plan outsources violence to the desert. The long-standing Tucson-based humanitarian organization, No More Deaths, reports that over the last two decades, the remains of at least 7,000 people have been recovered in the United States borderlands, dead from exposure, dehydration, falls, wounds, animal causes, and human assaults. Between 2012 and 2015, the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner received the remains of at least 593 border crossers. Bodies decompose quickly in the desert and De Leon estimates that for every body found there, five to 10 people have disappeared. Of course, he realizes that the desert is not the real mercenary. The violence is structured, structural, policy as perpetration and individually perpetrated by various actors, including smugglers, vigilante groups, and members of the border patrol. Seen here pouring out drinking water that's been left for crossers. In 19, in, in, sorry, in 2016 and 2017, Joshua Bonetta and JP Sniadecki drove and hiked through the Sonoran Desert, shooting footage on 16 millimeter film. The result was their mainly observational documentary, El Mar La Mar. And I think some of you may have been able to see it, thanks to Diana, this is what I hear. Um, the film was inspired by De Leon's research and filmed by invitation in and around one of his main fieldwork sites, which is in Arivaca, Arizona. Sniadecki offers that the film is not about the border, but about the desert. And I was fortunate to have the benefit of his generous help. So we have a, a Zoom within a Zoom. Um, this is JP Sniadecki, which is newly enabling. I've spoken about this film previously, but without the specific information about where the shots were actually taken. And now thanks to JP, in the first part of this talk, I will offer a close spatial analysis of the film and, and its spatial studies context. But neither is this talk only about the film. It is also very much about the desert. The Sonoran Desert is a, the Sonoran Desert is a border zone and a state of exception, the vile energies of which threaten to consume all earthly good. Settler colonialism, Oh, oh, here's the, this is the rationale. <laughs> Settler colonialism is, is the first element of the rationale that I wish to describe. A race-based system of accumulation through extraction of which climate disruption and profound unevenness is the imposition of its depredations. Um, these are logical consequences of this system of accumulation through extraction. As Carmen Gonzalez succinctly states, there is an integral relationship 
among climate change, racial subordination, and the capitalist world economy. Secondly, the US-Mexico border is a desperate destination created as such by more than a century of US policy that propped up Central American dictators and encouraged or ignored paramilitary death squads and other criminal activity. The American geopolitical wealth and power um, enacted are founded in petro-modernity. Climate change produced by fossil fuel emissions is another driver of migration from the dry corridor that extends from Panama north through Costa Rica, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and parts of Mexico, and is expanding. Zooming in one more level, or flying down in Google Earth, we find the wall image, a master signifier if there ever was one. Trump's big, beautiful wall, I'm guessing you followed all of this, galvanizes the racial hatred and fortress thinking that is the basis of his support. The veneer of his followers being all about jobs and, and his policies being about all about job creation was thin indeed and almost immediately effaced by blatant efforts at national securitization enacted on immigrant bodies and then also anti-Black and anti-Semitic foment. I call this multi-scalar arrangement of energetic orbitals, one, two, and three, settler colonialism, the border, the wall, I call that arrangement the Anthropocene. In the second part of this talk, and I haven't even, this is the introduction still, um, I will further the possibilities of this critique in relation to Catherine Yusuf's introduction of the inhuman or the inhumanities. This is her concept for an analytic um, that, is useful to expose, as she puts it, the conjoined geographies of racialization and ecological transformation, and to introduce a counter imaginary that opens up a fullness in the register of the world. Speaking alongside the film El Mar La Mar and inspired by its navigation of an elemental milieu, I will first A, read what I see as the film's own spatial logic, B, then talk a bit about spatial documentary studies as method in concert with border as method, and then see with regard to elemental matters, earth, air, fire, and water, join with Elmar Lamar to develop a media studies dimension of the geological turn that Yusuf calls for. The film presents the desert and the seven people we hear speaking in voiceover and also pauses attentively while the speakers and the desert make their own impressions. In her book, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None, Yusuf theorizes the Anthropocene as a formation of whiteness, heir to a racialized optic raised on the earth. With this presentation, I seek to counter map from a media studies perspective, the Anthropocenic optic being raised upon the Sonoran Desert and to support the necessity and the vitality of strenuous crossings into geosocial and alternate geological futures. So now for that wind that we will now perhaps make out. But anyway, this is, a, this is the beginning of the film. The film is in uh, several parts. And this first part called Prio River is about four minutes long. I'm not going to show the whole thing. I'm just going to show enough for you to get a feel for this this aspect of the film, the, the sensory aspect. Okay. This shot was taken by JP Smiadecki hanging out of the car window, operating the camera. And as he described it to me, changing focal length and focus, making different movements, and also letting my hands or my body move along with the car as well. And there is a lot to say about this shot. And for the moment, I'll just let it be ground rather than figure. In El Mar La Mar, this is the last we see of the wall. And we're given only a few other images of human fortification. The desert knows nothing of international boundaries. The film's border imaginary 
contributes to the cause of unwalling, a term developed by Teddy Cruz and political scientist Fauna Foreman to resist the consequences of wall construction and fetishization. Humanitarian organizations and the US Customs and Border Patrol for that matter, have pointed to the wall's ample contradictions. A significant majority of people in the country illegally did not sneak in across the Southern border, but arrived legally and then overstayed. The wall has not been shown to cut down on unauthorized entry. According to a border patrol spokesman, a surveillance video filmed a child successfully circumventing a fence minutes after its installation. The number of border crosses has been on an overall downward trend since 2000. Uh, right now, there's a seasonal increase, and we'll, we'll see whether that is, it's more than a seasonal increase. We don't know yet. The wall is not the high concrete barrier of Trumpian imagination. Only about one third of the border has been fortified, and various types of barriers, steel tubes, barbed wire, recycled railroad tracks, wire mesh, repurposed Vietnam era Air Force landing strips, high-tech surveillance systems, and subterranean probes. All of these also vary in their permeability by people on foot. This is not to slight the catastrophe of the border's tangible effects and outsource violence, but to think how this insupportable figure can be dissipated, destabled, and unwalled. Though it's not fully horizontal, the southern border is conceptualized as a line on a map flowing generally east-west, and it is traced as such, for example, in this major interactive mapping project by USA Today Network. And, and actually, where you can, you can move the, the little helicopter icon to a part of the wall, a part of the border and see what, what sort of barrier, if any, is there. So you can look at the entire wall from the, this interactive visioning tool. Uh, and actually trajectories from south to north also emphasize the east-west linearity as a discrete boundary to be crossed. Miguel Fernandez Lavallan has talked in the European context about how for migrants jumping the fence can become ingrained and ritualized and repeated. In other words, the, the funneling effect of prevention through deterrence, however paradoxically, serves to further and plot the horizontal border. And actually this, the funneling is, is narrows, it goes from wide to narrow at the border. So this, uh, this, this image is a little, um, obliquely related to that. So this is, looks like an upside down funnel, but I think the other funnel they mean is, is the one narrowing at the top. Elmar Lamar's cartography is different than this east-west line of demarcation by virtue of its multi-directionality. As I mentioned, the vast majority of the wall lacks a physical barrier that would block pedestrian traffic and much of the official borderline is unmarked on the land. During the filming process, Bonetta and Sniadecki hiked supplies with the Tucson Samaritans on the Mexican side from the port of entry in Nogales to the Juan Bosco migrant shelter, and then on the US side along canyon trails frequented by refugees coming across. With the benefit of knowing specific details of shot location and directionality, I argue that the film rewrites in the filmic idiom this imposed geography as simultaneously multidirectional and unwalled. So the opening sequence that we saw, Prio, was shot right here um, along the border in Sasabi. But actually, in the orientation of the film, it was moving from uh, west to east along a service road that runs parallel to the border wall. These pesos, this roll of money, um, are were shot in the Oregon Pipe National Monument area. And then this shot was from near Arivaca Lake, looking to the Northwest. And here we get a, a glimpse of the electrical grid infrastructure of the area. So that's the directionality of that shot. 
then we have Chris, also in this area, we have Crystal Cave, which is down uh, to the southeast near the ghost town of Ruby. We get a glimpse of the, the underground water in the area. And then this is also shot in the Aravaca Lake area. These jugs were hung by the group, people helping people near a religious altar, honoring the dead. Also contributing to unwalling is the frequent use of black screen as a backdrop to the stories of the crossers and those who encounter them. A man tells of immigrants, of migrants who returned in search of the brother they had had to leave with some food while they went for help and the brother had not survived. Two migrants who did make it happened across the filmmakers and agreed to tell their story. And we hear their words and one man's audible crying. Crossers must continue walking long after passing the invisible line marking US territory. Ronald Rael, uh, excuse me, Ray, Rael, Rael refers to this region as Usonia adapting Frank Lloyd Wright's original meaning of the term to encompass Mexico and the United States as the United States of North America. In the film, we hear the voice of a young woman interviewee, Olivia Waterhouse, describing how she and others discovered the body of a woman dead from exposure. We know from Jason de Leon that this woman is Maricela Yagui, a wife and mother of three who traveled from Ecuador and died here in Usonia. A man interviewed in Chicago years after he entered the US explains the experience of crossing. I really appreciate the expression of physical, phenomenological, psychic and poetic experience. In, in conducting and incorporating this interview, the film affirms this man's self-determination with respect to his migration pathway and mobility decisions. And I'm relating this man's experience to Carmen Gonzalez's discussion of migration in general. Moreover, in terms of its overall approach to displacement, the film seems to share this man's sensory compass. Elmar Lamar is an illuminated room of a film our vision dilates, yet we don't know where we are. The film's mosaic of shots of variable place, time, directionality, granularity, weather, and scale constitute a counter map of this borderscape, a rewritten geography that is resistant, aspirational, and more fully humane. My own positionality is oblique. I don't have family ties to the region, nor have I traveled there to conduct this research yet. But I do feel connected and committed to the struggle for justice in this border zone. As the great granddaughter of people who fled the anti Semitic violence of the Belarusian Pale, as a US citizen whose family reaped the benefits of American settler society, and in whose name Fortress America, Fortress USA, is perpetrated. And then too, as a scholar of site-specific documentary film and other forms of geolocational media with a focus on critical environmental justice. And now finally, what you may have been thinking all along, here I am an American speaking in Israel virtually about a wall, a desert and the instantiation of racial difference. As I mentioned at the start, this talk is part of a larger project that is site-specific but not conceived within an area studies research paradigm. It began in Israel. And I have the Tel Aviv International Colloquium on Cinema and Television Studies and its longtime conveners and participants to thank. And then also Ido R and the inspiration of his film, Nine Star Hotel, and, and now all of you. And I'm especially eager for our, our discussion for this reason as well. Contemporary documentary studies was born from the realization that nonfiction films are after all representational and therefore rhetorical or fictive as Michael Renov puts it um, in the truth claims they project. 
Well, what I argue is that the same is true of the spatial dimension. Even the most locally specific documentary film is simultaneously place specific and geographically fictive, if you will. And that, that, that is precisely where the meaning resides. This is Nine Star Hotel. The film was shot over time, about a year, I think, and over space, and then mosaic together. And um, this is the, the, the path that one envisions of the migrants from the West Bank, Almedia, to this hill where they camped inside of Israel that they, the migrants, dis, dis, or the workers, the Palestinian workers, described as Nine Star Hotel. This was in 2006. And, and I should say that the piece is also influenced by Anat Zanger's concept of block space and the transference zone. And I should say that it's also published in uh, Raz and Boaz's book, Deeper Than Oblivion. So, but when I ended up talking with Ido, and he was kind enough to break down the first 35 shots of the film for me, I realized that it's just not as simple as crossing in and plus the crossing was actually a composite of multiple crossings. So you can see where the first shot is, oh, wrong computer. Oh, you can see where the first shot is here. And then the second, oops, the second shot is facing the other direction and way over here. And then the third shot of the film and the fourth shot of the film are up here and facing in that direction. And so we, uh, it, it, you can see that one of, the, one of the issues of this type of research is that the researcher is really dependent on the filmmaker. And the way we did it, I, I just contacted Ido via email and then he agreed to talk with me via Skype at that time. And I created a, I had a computer in my media center. So behind me, I, I pulled up a, an image from Google Earth. And then I was looking into my computer, Skyping with Ido and sort of saying, well, where, where, where were you? Where were you in space and place? And then he said, well, I don't see very well. Why don't you just grab a Google Earth shot and send it to me and I will make this, I will Photoshop it for you. So this isn't the one he Photoshopped, but he, he did spend quite a while Photoshopping these for me and then send it to me. And then we, we remade it in different ways. And then, oops, wrong computer again. <laughs> Um, and then ultimately, we were able, I was able to come to Israel thanks to Raya and, and the colloquium and, uh, and actually get together in that, in that very spot. So site-specific documentary films constitute the socio-spatial relations they may purport only to depict. As navigational and geolocational media, they possess a kinship with other such. Google Earth interactive visionings of sea level rise, say, camera traps for animals crossing migratory corridors. And I'll show a couple of images right at the end of geolocational media are on one hand and on one in the, at one and the same time, resource media. And by that, I mean to say that the instruments with which they were photographed or scanned are manufactured through resource intensive processes. They are also geolocational media in that they're human operated and they are environmentally embedded as they image make their way across the surface of the earth or through the air above or the sea below. I appreciate Jason de Leon's critique of prevention through deterrence as violence outsourced to the desert and El Mar Lamar's means of evoking that violence through testimony of aid workers, locals, trackers, and survivors, through images of belongings left in the desert and through the atmospheric surround, fog and dirt, temperature and pressure. El Mar Lamar does not include images of the dead as do other films of the US-Mexico border, such as Muriendo por Cruzar, Dying to Cross by Marissa Venegas. And De Leon's book, The Land of Open Graves, Living and Dying on the Migrant Trail, which are more ethnographic in nature. 
But what Elmar Lamar does do in conjunction with its work of counter mapping the racialized Anthropocene is to broach an alternative geologic in Yusuf's term. In Elmar Lamar, the desert is formidable and agential, though not essentially violent or aggressive. The desert harbors the passage of crossers past pre-Cambrian outcroppings and through the calderas of volcanoes active 20 to 40 million years ago, registering their footprints until a wind whips up to reorganize the sandy medium. And I'll just play a little bit of a clip that I think also does a good job of evoking the experience of learning to observe and sense the desert ecosystem. The body of a passing animal would shed a twig that a person might carry a ways before dropping. Plants find their ideal elevations and exposures. The wind chimes in to add a stanza to a poem of sand and shoes. In this passage too, Elmar Lamar reminds us that the Sonoran Desert is a more than human character and witness to the intensive dispersed activity of hiding and seeking passage and capture, or as the case may be, inhabitation in place. In his philosophy of elemental media, John Durham Peters, quoting Horish, points out that well into the 19th century, when one spoke of media, one typically meant the natural elements, such as water and earth, fire and air, unquote. Also in the life sciences, gels and other substances for growing cultures were media. And I would add today, in the sciences, even today in the sciences and in the discourses of government agencies that are in charge of land, air, and water, the term media is used so contaminated media to which people might be exposed include air, water, and sediment. Peters proposes flipping the old idea that media are environments so as to understand environments as media. Media are both vehicles that carry and communicate meaning and environmental repositories of readable data and processes that sustain and enable existence. Elmar Lamar abides in this elemental media vein, perhaps influenced in part by Sniadecki's background in the Harvard Sensory Ethnography Lab. Bonetta and Sniadecki spent a whole day and into the night filming a massive fire, skirting the fire lines, edging closer and closer. And then they arrayed the footage across the film ordered for impact rather than chronology. Bolts of lightning diagram the sky. The crystal cave near Arivaca, Arizona sends forth echoes of a woman singing as she cools off in its natural water source, pooling at the bottom of the chamber. The sand inscribes footprints. Elmar Lamar reflexively announces its mediatic existence through the use of film stock that was not pristine when loaded into the camera magazine and therefore delivers up surprises in the form of flashes and scratches on the exposed developed image. And that's what we saw in the, in the Rio images and in the, some of the title cards I've shown. Sometimes it's even difficult to tell what are flashes of lightning against a black sky and what are bright flickers from scratches on the emulsion. The film is a mediatic writing pad for the desert's powers of inscription. But with this elemental discussion, I wanna make it clear that my commitment is definitely not formalist, but geologic inspired by Yusuf's critique of Anthropocene discourse that follows a humanist coming of age script that neglects the historical roots of the Anthropocene economy in the geologics of race, even while purporting to explain humans as a geomorphic force. By way of example, she points out that financial payouts to slave owners during, the, during abolition underpinned the industrial revolution in Britain. I agree that analyses of an ostensibly colorblind Anthropocene with a species level problem, humans are destroying the planet rather than individual captains of industry are destroying the planet and perpetrating unjust environmental injustice. Um, that species level, the, the, you know, that type of analysis 
is what I'm calling the Anthropocene, and it's inadequate to the reconceptualization of the Anthropocene. Then with regard to the inhumanities or the inhuman, which is a major focus of Yusuf's scholarship, she seeks to reimagine subjectivity, I'm quoting, reimagine subjectivity in the context of the ground that sustains it, parenthesis she puts, or the earth, or to figure out an approach capable of linking biological and biopolitical life with geological and geopolitical life in their forms of differentiation. In her article, Geologic Life, Yusuf stages a mod modest conversation across two fossil layers. The fossil layer of the Carboniferous period 300 million years ago that we now tap or frack for fossil fuel energy and the future fossil layer of, the, of Anthropocene humans. This conversation seems an apt metonym for a geologic where people risk their lives to cross a heating up desert, while plastics and other petroleum products and e-waste made from rare earth minerals bloat our stratigraphic layer to be. I find that reading the film El Mar La Mar together with Yusuf brings out or draws our attention to this Sonoran desert geologic. As a person from the US, I would add to this picture local geologies of race the 500 year decimation and dispossession of Native American peoples on which this settler state and its wealth are contingent. And the toxic stew that energy development has rained down on people abroad and here in the United States, the so-called nuclear experiments of the pre and post-war period in the Marshall Islands and in New Mexico that were actually detonations. The fallout remains as radiation poisoning in the bodies of the Marshallese and Chicanos of Nuevo Mexicano, New Mexico. Nuclear energy being, of course, another deep time geologic. The body burden of people funneled or forced into the Sonoran Desert relates through this linkage of unjust energy and resource regimes to the racialized structures of vile political and geologic life. So, with all of this in mind, I would like to wayfind one more aspect of the geologic life of El Mar La Mar. And then just a, a couple of images by way of a coda. Sneadeki told me that he tried not to take too many shots of Babo Quivari Peak. But none of us can resist its pull. In looking for the pattern of the film, my students noticed the, the mountain's distinctive outline as it reappeared in multiple shots throughout the film and their instincts were right. It seems to ground the film. And the images from the fire escape are also Baba Kivari Peak, and that's it in the distance. Baba Kivari Peak is a major sacred site of the Tohono O'odham people who regard it as the navel of the world. Here the earth opened up and the people emerged after the great flood. Countermapping indigenous belonging is not the explicit creative impulse of the film in the way that unwalling is. And yet, if we pay close attention to the array of shots and angle of approach, Baba Kivari Peak stands forth as a significant geocinematic figure. While I haven't yet sought out traditional ind indigenous maps showing Baba Kivari, I can say that indigenous cartography practices do not prioritize scale as do Western maps, but rather situated knowledge, navigational practices, and cosmological conspicuity. In its filmic representation of Bobby Kivari, Elmar Lamar, however inadvertently, resonates with the geologic life of the Tohono O'odham, or that is of their predecessors, thousands of years before, who, according to the tribe's official website, were master dwellers of the Sonoran Desert. They irrigated crops of cotton, tobacco, corn, beans, and squash with sophisticated canal systems. And here's where it's located. Since 1854, the tribal territory of the Tohono O'odham Nation has been bisected by the US-Mexico border. 
Members of the Tohono O'odham Nation have continued to protect the land and water of the area, but international, the international border has disturbed, disturbed sacred sites and impeded traditional activities and ceremonies in which Tohono O'odham on both sides of the border participate together. The growing scholarly literature and other forms of traditional ecological knowledge provide information about indigenous resistance to racist, extractivist, anthropocenic economies and the nature culture divide of Western philosophy in favor of spiritual cosmologies and life ways from time immemorial where not only plants and animals, but even rocks and mountains are seen as animate living beings. We are older than the boundary, stated tribal chairman Ned Norris Jr. in his testimony against the wall. Now under President Biden, a bit of hope. This is the first Native American Secretary of the Interior. The wall is being remediated. Construction under Trump took place without environmental impact studies or mitigation efforts. Vegetation was stripped away to create huge enforcement zones. Hundreds of habitats and species were affected including migratory wildlife corridors of jaguars and what a Scientific American Journal article calls an international bison herd. Riparian areas, natural water flows and wetlands were described, but the desert is a living desert. The border wildlife study uses camera traps placed along 30 miles of border and it has already collected 12,000 images documenting more than 100 species since March of 2020. These cameras see in many directions and many of their lenses can see in the dark. The US-Mexico border of the present time is an anthropos anthropocene of unremediated violence, racism and reach. Moving in sync with Elmar Lamar and Catherine Yusuf's pattern shifts of temporality, philosophy, propinquity, scale, mediation, registration, and sensory attunement, I have sought to cultivate strenuous crossings of all kinds as vital to the enactment of a racially just, sustainable, and unwalled geologic in the Sonoran Desert and beyond. Thank you. Yeah, so the floor is open, please. Um, yeah. I have, uh, thank you for a brilliant talk and for introducing the film and this wonderful methodology. Um, I have a kind of nasty question. Uh, could it be used by say someone on the right whose sense of uh, a just border would be very different from maybe our sense? Could, could the methodology or the film? Yes, you're the film or both, and the methodology. Right. The methodology. Yeah, well, well would it be okay if I just answered first in relation to the film? The film, just to say that the film is not um, explicitly political. The, the unwalling is you know, something that I read into the film, but I think it's, it's, it's I, I hope I was able to argue that it is really there concretely, if intuitively, on the part of the filmmakers. Um, but that said, they they gave a sense of all the various inhabitants of the area, and in some cases, they limited the interviews with people. So, in fact, they did not give a political platform to some of the people who are interviewed who who are not, who do not believe in unwalling. They, but nevertheless, they conveyed the difficulties of the, the, the border, which then is porous and then creates this problem of migration for a bunch of people across the political spectrum. So even if you're a Republican, if your ranch is there, it, it's disturbing to find people coming across. And you know, again, this is a 2,000 mile border that um, is 
this largely porous. So this is a distinction between the U.S.-Mexico border context, I think, and the context of Israel-Palestine. But it's it is really um, not well, in fact, not walled. Okay, so that's what the film. I think that the film skews toward more humane practices at the border by its choice of interview material. And so then, and then in in this methodology. I'm really, I, I want to ask a follow-up question as to why you think it could be used in that way, because the, the basis of the, the geologic methodology is the argument that um, that this, that, that there's, well, you, you, you heard what I said, that there's a racial basis to our capitalist extractive regime that has disrupted the, the climate. And my own, um, entry point into all of that is to not to try to solve problems of climate disruption, but to look at places where in environmentally unjust things have occurred due to climate disruption. Because according to social ecology, those who are um, already disadvantaged tend to suffer more when these things happen. So that's where, where I want to focus. And then in terms of the border, I guess my talk doesn't suggest policy. But if I were to suggest policy, I agree with what Biden was saying in some of his last his, his press conference and when he speaks, which is if we pour resources into cities and communities and countries on either side of the border, then, then that is going to make it more um, feasible for people to remain in place if they have working economies. And he gave the example of putting lights in in a city that was crime ridden. I can't remember which country it was. I, I, kind of, I wonder if it was El Salvador or Honduras. I can't quite remember what he said. Putting in street lights and then cutting down on crime and just making it more habitable. So. I didn't. I saw the this methodology as stemming from a critique of the racist basis. So I, I'm just really curious what, why you, you know, see that it could be, um, you know, well, uh, hijacked by the rabbit. Well, well, partly I, th I think the the images of the maps that could be used, say, for a military operation. There is some. Um, similarity, I guess, at least for me. Maybe it's because I'm Israeli. Um, and partly because um, I, I guess right, uh, right wing approaches can be as creative, look at the same problem and explain it differently. So I was wondering whether you encountered any you mean other the map? readings. Uh, uh, Doha's map uh, looks like something that comes with for military, military experience. Mm -hmm. Well, we know, we know, we've known for a long time, and I talk about in the article that you helped me with as the editor, so thank you very much, uh, the way that Ayal Wiseman has talked about Israeli generals saying that they are postmodern now, and so they can, they can um, use space differently and punch through the walls of homes in refugee camps instead of walk along the street where they'll be vulnerable to sniper fire. So, yeah. I mean, I don't, well, maybe we shouldn't put this up on the YouTube channel. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't uh, think that, that, that I'm showing anything that is not already known. And in fact, there's that USA Network project that I showed you that, that has, has filmed the entire border and it's completely accessible. And in terms of whether, yeah, well, okay, so I, this talk doesn't talk about the use of border surveillance by the border patrol to capture crossers, but it could, I mean, there is a, a significant amount of research on that score, but whether or not migrants can use high tech, um, methods to make their way across, which would be a problem for people who want a non-porous border. They haven't, I don't think it's very successful. There's the, the Ricardo Dominguez 
project, the electron out of the electronic disturbance theater, which is called the, oh, what is it? The uh, something like, I, it's, I can't think of it. The migrant border tool. I can't exactly think of it. It's a border tool, which was supposed to be a navigational tool, but it, it ended up not ever being put into use. And then whenever migrants try to use Google Earth or cell phone technology, they are vulnerable to all these, these criminals who are in the area who want to kidnap migrants and gain ransom from their families. So I, I'm seeing different di articles with different views as to whether migrants use the technology. It seems like it might not be as successful as we would think due to that vulnerability. So, I mean, you're right in that sense that, that there, there are always these vulnerabilities and possibilities, but I don't really think anything I'm using is a big surprise and not otherwise widely available. Um, thank you. It, but you raise many interesting issues. <laughs> Well, just one other follow-up. Nicole Staroselsky, you know her book, Underwater Media, about trans-Pacific cables going from the Americas to Asia. Um, when, once when she, she was a graduate student in our department, we were talking about it, and we noticed that the book in, in, in talking about the different cable landing stations, the stations themselves are insulated, but the cables just snake through, uh, down through the, you know, on the bottom of the ocean and then up, up on land and into the cable stations. So yeah, so here's this humanities scholarship that does identify ca cable landing stations and a possible vulnerability. But, uh, but again, I don't think it's, it, it's not that difficult to discern anyway. Oh, hi. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much, Janet, for this really stimulating talk as usual. And thank you for accepting our invitation and coming here to do this lecture. Um, I want to, to ask you a question that kind of relates um, El Mar Le Mar to the group that it belongs to, and that is the Sensory Ethnography Lab in Harvard. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you're probably aware of the fact that there's been kind of um, a dominant, and I would call call it a self-proclaimed discourse about those films as being immersive or creating an immersive experience for the viewer from this kind of a heightened sense of audiovisual representation. And I think that um, this is a discourse that has been kind of advocated by the filmmakers themselves. It's very um, similar, I think, in many ways to the discourse that has been dominant with direct cinema, um, you know, um, the, the filmmakers of direct cinema kind of advocating for us to see that as those films as being kind of a pure unmediated depictions of reality that, that, that creates the self sense of being there. And of course, as much as there's been a scholarship against it, like Gene Hall's essay, there's been some scholarship against seeing those films as simply immersive experiences. And I think El Mal Amal is a really interesting piece of work because it's not, it, it's very, it, it's very different from Leviathan or from yeah. Streetgrass. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and, and, I'm, and I wonder where you stand here because I've read a piece by Vinicius, Vinicius Navarro about El Mar Lamar that also resists this discourse. And he calls uh, this film, El Mar Lamar, um, a film that, he, that has this uneasy sense of place and unexpected juxtapositions, and therefore it's completely outside of this discourse. Yeah. And, and you yourself said, you know, I'm doing this a geological uh, depiction, a ge ge geological uh, discussion rather than a formalist. So, so you're, in, in a way you're avoiding this question that may be non-relevant, but, but, but is it? Is it relevant for a kind of aligning place in politics? Is it, is it important for you to, to put that within this discourse? Yeah, th thank you for that question. And also, I was thinking about you when I was writing this talk, because I know you heard an earlier version. And I feel like, to me, this is completely transformed by my conversation with Sniadeki and by the, the discussion of 
elemental media and in human geography in relation to it. So I, I hope you you uh, thought that as well. But anyway, okay, so another big question. Um, I studied direct cinema with Stephen Mamber, who wrote Cinema Verite in America. And so I am hearkening back to maybe the, the, the late 70s and the early 80s. And neither he nor I nor, nor anyone I agree with, you know, including Marcelo Fools or you know, other people, think that direct cinema is, in fact, you know, value neutral or politically objective. Um, so I, when he, I think that book, when was that published? I can't remember if, it was, if the book was, it was published prior to that, maybe even 10 years prior to that. So it's really interesting to think about documentary historiography and the place of direct cinema. And I've thought for a long time that in fact, documentary films historically are less like direct cinema even prior to and even during and even after than one would think because in our historiography, direct cinema looms large. And so I guess kind of like the auteur theory, they, made, they were making an argument of the spontaneous recording of reality that, um, that was their that was their method and that was their look, but never ever. And you'll, I, I'm sure I'm well, I can't assume anything, but I think most people here would agree that it's that direct cinema is, is not, and has never been at all objective. It always, each piece always comes from a certain perspective. So, so then you have the sensory ethnography lab and Lucien Castaigne Taylor and Barbash and this idea of the immer immersion. I also don't, find those films politically neutral because if, say you mentioned Leviathan, say there's a shot on the surface of the water as the boat is going along and as the boat is dumping its bycatch and ju you just see all these dead sea creatures that have resulted in this particular method of fishing. So this does not seem to me to be an objective, um, I mean, a way of of shooting and presenting fishing. So I have never believed in that objective method. Now, with regard to El Mar La Mar, I know, I know it comes out of, it's a Sneadecki film, but it is certainly not his most sensory ethnographic film. He has some others that are more unblinking, uh, even, but even those I don't think are apolitical, like Iron Ministry, which is made around fairly recently around the same time as El Mar La Mar, and it's, it's marvelous. So I, I, it's not wholly within that paradigm. For one thing, you have these test, you have the seven testimonies in the film. So I see it more like this, uh, the work of Kathy Kasich, who has, has defined this term sensory verite. And I don't think, I didn't ask JP about this and I haven't yet talked to Joshua Bonetta. So I, it's, it is more of a sensory verite film rather than within the the um, the that that so-called. I mean, the definitely immersive, but certainly not neutral paradigm of the SEL. I mean, what uh, what do you? Can we have a little dialogue? I mean, I'm curious what you think about such matters. Or maybe that's not appropriate in this con. It's a colloquium. I'll just interfere. Does the beauty matter? It's a beautiful uh -huh. film. Uh huh. Oh, gorgeous. I think. Well, I guess I've read it as the desert's agential impression. But does but do you, you don't think that beauty militates against <laughs> politics, right? So. Um, uh, well, it's a hard question, but but there is something about the immersion that can be mm -hmm. overwhelming. Yeah, the desert, it's definitely gorgeous, but then you have these people who talk about 
animals that are about to attack them or crags that are about to scratch them or precipices that they can plummet down. So you have that version of the desert. And then you have a few animals here and there, really not. The deer was kind of an exceptional shot within the film, but you do have other indications of the living desert. So I don't think that it glamorizes or, or really sensationalizes the desert over and against the experience that the migrants are having, in my view. Um, but I suppose anyone can make another argument. Yeah, and, and as Ohad said, people have. There's also a, in, in the new book, Deep Mediations has a chapter on Elmar Lamar. And then there's also a, um, uh, an interview in Scott McDonald's book with Bonetta and Sniadecki about this film and then Sniadecki's other work for people who wanna, I mean, is this, is this not always the, a question of work that's in a more experimental vein? But I, I really do think this film, though not in a political filmmaking idiom, does argue for unwalling first of all, by not showing the wall and showing all this multiple inhabitation of the area by different stakeholders. Uh, Janet, who coined the term sensory verite? I like this term because it brings oh, together yeah. sensorial and your observational strategies. Yeah, she's this woman named Kathy Kasich, K-A-S-I-C, and she has an amazing film called Loose Horses. And in that, that film is very much about horsiness. <laughs> so it's immersive in that way, it's sensory in that way. You're sort of in among the horses and you're seeing their whiskers illuminated from behind. And But then you, there are also interviews and they talk about the problem of their being too many horses to find homes on ranches. And so some of them are having to be auctioned off and euthanized. And so, so the film has a, a point of view, clearly has a point of view, but is immersive. And then she also just recently, she has a, she interviewed a, an artist in an issue of Media Plus Environment that I co-edit and actually in the stream that Lisa Parks and I co-edited on da Disaster Media and in there, you can read a little bit about her film because she, she got an NSF grant with scientists to go to Antarctica to open up a subglacial lake that has never been opened and to film that process. So yeah, so she is the one who coined that, that phrase. An actual filmmaker, see? So I, I like hearing the voices of filmmakers as well as seeing their films. <laughs> Um, I think Anat would like to ask. Hey. Hi, Jeanette. It's a pleasure Hi. to see you here with us. And it was a wonderful talk. I think uh, I find the methodology very interesting and the way you take the spatial studies into a new direction. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen the film. I would like to, if it's possible. So I will ask you about the films that has to do with the uh, Mexico-US border and it's relevant. It's in, in the zone of avant-garde film. And I'm talking about Chantal Ackerman film from 2002 uh, from the other side. And maybe you could comment about, I don't like to be asked about film that I'm not talking about, but uh, I, I hope you'll be able to somehow to connect it to the to the feeling that you're talking about. I don't. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I, okay, um, no, I'm glad. I, I've known. I've actually had the privilege of meeting Chantal Ackerman yeah. once, you know, a million years ago at UCLA, and I and I love her work and I follow her work, but I'm not. I can't actually. I'm not prepared to talk about this film. But if you could say a little more, maybe we could. Uh, 
Well, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting feeling, but it's not this in the same, it's not as immersive as the feeling that you're talking about, but she, she made the installation and a feeling which has to do with both sides of the border. And she follow the Mexican side and the US side, and she make all, all her character to cross the border. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very interesting, also her uh, language, which is always uh, fascinating. And uh, I wonder how, how you, your, if not this specific film, how you relate to other border film or to other desert film, is it has any interconnection? Yeah. Because, well, I, I, just one more sentence, I think that the uh, desert has the quality has in it the immersive quality already, the desert as a location. Well, thank you. Okay, this is really interesting. Thank you very much. So I was thinking about your work the entire time I wrote <laughs> this talk, as well as when I was writing um, the one about Nine Star Hotel, because as I said in the talk, your, your notion of the transference zone is really important, but you're, when you, you would write on a checkpoint, checkpoint, let's say, or a check films about checkpoints, I guess that's a, that's a particular optic that then opens the possibility. And, and you're saying that they are these transference zones where, where, people from different areas already mix. And I, I think that that's absolutely insightful and right. And, and I think that, you know, for their broader spaces that are also these kinds of transference zones and the US-Mexico border, and maybe, you know, that all, all of the Usonia is such a transference zone where people are already mixing. And the, the labor of separation is as hard as it is precisely because the space is multiply inhabited. And as I was saying about the US-Mexico border, that is not the main way that people enter from Central and South America. The way they enter is they fly to the United States and then overstay their visas. And more than 50% of undocumented migrants from that same area are there because of that. So it's already a transference zone. The whole thing is a transference zone. So, but this is not to say that, that films that are about crossing aren't important, they are. And I can think of a, a question that relates to, or that I asked my students that relates to that prior question about direct cinema. So in Stephen Mamber's book, he talked about the crisis structure that was used by Drew Associates. So if you film a contest or you film some kind of, election, so primary is a, is a good example of it, then you will have a found fiction and an inbuilt crisis that you can use to structure your film. So one day in the late 80s, I said to my students, well, can you think of any possibilities for a crisis documentary? And the first idea that was broached was, how about a film of someone crossing the US-Mexico border? because then you'll have an inbuilt crisis. Either they will have gotten across or they won't have gotten across. And so, and then we talked about the, the, the logistics and the ethics and all the difficulties of that. But really there are a lot of films. This guy named Gregory Nava made a fiction film in the eighties that's really important. It's called El Norte. And it's about border, these uh, brother and sister who crossed the border, the US Mexico border through a tunnel. And then I think they've also worked on, he's also worked on documentaries. And I think he did also actually enact that idea for a crossing film. So the, the one I talked about, Muriendo Pusar by Marisa Venegas, she does, they go down to countries in Central America to interview the families of people who either disappeared or perished. And so it's, it's, it's an important initiative. And Jason DeLeon does that as well in his book. 
he, in, in the research that he used for his book, he went down to Ecuador. And I, that type of film is really important to, to say to people who would otherwise not think this, which many of us would already know this, that, that the, yes, migrants have wives and, and children and parents and so on, and to, to humanize for the rest of the world that, that just wants to, to keep them out or is, you know, has racist feelings about migrants, that these, that these people, you know, to, to, to show a little of the, the texture and detail of their lives. So the cross, so this, all this is a long answer to say that the crossing film and filming on both sides of the border is really important. And I, I just think it's a different, project than this one. This one, it seems to be more, more resonating with your work, even though it's, it's not like the films you talk about necessarily, but in its ideological import, because it, it films all over, you know, north of the border, and there may have been some filming done <laughs> south of the border, one can't say, but it, it opens up that whole area. And de-emphasizes the borderline. And I, as I was saying in the talk, people, people are still walking in the desert long after they cross the border into the United States and they can die there. So I guess this, this is a different sort of film, but not to say that those ethnographic projects that try to reconnect families and people on either side aren't also important. It, it, they're, they're in a different category. Thank you. And what do you think about the desert as an immersive oh, yeah, desert. location by the itself? Well, well, it's funny you should ask that because the reason why I chose to work with Catherine Yusoff's ideas, well, I guess maybe it's not the reason. I've been following her work for a long time. But one of the things that encouraged me to go with her ideas and then at, and then not to bring in the ideas of Elizabeth Povinelli, who writes about geontology, not geology, but geontology. And they know each other and they and Yusuf has interviewed Povinelli and has asked specifically, what is it about the onto, the ontological part of geontology that resonates with you? Um, is because Elizabeth, because I found this interview with Elizabeth Povinelli about the desert that I thought made it seem like there were no living things, you know, not a sprig of cactus, if you can call it a sprig, that there were no living things in the desert. So yeah, I think the desert is a, a really interesting um element, what, what, what would we say, uh, uh, elemental entity. And my colleague, Dick Hebdige, you know, the guy who was part of the Birmingham School and wrote the book Subcultures, among other books, has been thinking about the desert and teaches a course called Desert Immersion. So uh, yeah, I do want to think more about the desert in its elemental um, aspect, but, but never as a uh, an unliving space. And mm -hmm. I, think, I think that Yusuf, one of the ways that she distinguishes her own ideas is she says she's not a new materialist, like say Star Wasselsky or Lima or Ava Horn. So she, she doesn't see herself as participating with new materialists or, or Bennett, Jane Bennett, Vibrant Matter. And I think part of it is because the, the new materialists, though not intentionally, tend to deal with the, with non-human animals or the more than human and less with geological features. Mm -hmm. So I guess maybe I'm a paradoxical Yusofian who also thinks the desert is alive and agential. The, you're right though, people, I think that more and more as, well, first of all, we're experiencing desertification and more mm -hmm. and more people talk about the desert and you all would you know, there must be incredible literature, yes. Israeli scholarly literature on the desert that I should, I should find out about. So I, I'm open to your suggestions. 
uh, well, I think about it and we continue it. <laughs> we continue. I, I, I planned it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I... Janet, may I? Please. Um, I was wondering while you were talking, and thanks so much for this fascinating talk, why didn't you use any of the concept or conceptualization of trauma discourse in your talk? <laughs> I know what happens to the trauma and and this I don't know this inhumanities or or, or yeah. you, the new sin that you described is, is there any is there any room for this discourse it's I in guess alternative geologic well this is not my field but I I, I really I wonder why well, did you put it aside yeah, thanks for that wonderful suggestion about how I can help, how I can make a make a contribution to this conversation as a trauma studies scholar. I, I thought that my contribution was to um, in the the discourse of the inhumanities was that of a media scholar. But you're right. Why not? But what's the connection the between the two fields? Right. Yeah, and, and but I also, I, I don't think that my trauma studies orientation is not there. I think it's, it's not explicit because I, I guess I think it's there everywhere. So I, you're right, I should do a better job of, of, of well, I mean, I know you didn't tell me to do this. <laughs> but I'm taking it as a marvelous, I choose to take it as a marvelous suggestion to make more explicit the way in which thoughts about psychic trauma can open up. And I mean, and of course, we have this crisis at the border, which is also a psychological crisis of people who are, you know, children who are con being confined and Biden's having a hard time doing what he said, which was in a week, I'm gonna have all the children in either in, collective homes or in, in foster homes or in their own relatives' homes. And then it, it just ended up being logistically really difficult. So there's massive traumatization happening at the border. And it could it could be a whole book. Yeah, maybe that would be. And um, yeah, the, the oh, but more specifically about the film, I think yeah. it's a fascinating case of post-traumatic film. Oh. Yeah. Well, well, great, well, great suggestion. This is a wonderful idea. I don't know. Depending yeah. on how. Well, in in the well, I mean, when I have talked about trauma, say in the book Trauma Cinema, for example, yeah, I do like to talk about it's the way it's inexplicit and elusive and uh, part partly psychic and um, but propped on experiential occurrences that then affect this the the psychic structure and then the, but then the question becomes how how is it marked in cinema and so you yeah you've talked about in i mean in, in your voluminous scholarship and multiple books developed these cinematic yeah approaches to the tra to trauma uh, but yeah it's it's i definitely think that its cinematic marks are, are elusive, amnesiac, um, inexplicit. And so maybe it is in these very elements that one could pursue the, the trauma cinema that is Elmar Lamar, but not without losing sight of the, the socio-political context. So it's just a tall order having to talk about the psychic stuff, the sociopolitical stuff, and then also the now the geopolitical and the geological stuff. But you're right, maybe by centering on this film, that would be a way to grapple with many, many ideas from different approaches, but but maintaining this film as the as the central object. Thank you. Or maybe I'm obsessed with trauma, I don't know, just 
But well, I mean, outsourcing right. violence to the desert. I, I don't, yeah, I guess I, you know how people, <laughs> I don't know. I really have thought of trauma in a social context as Bhaskar and I talk about in documentary testimonies. That, that was always my idea about it. Even in trauma cinema, where I deal with incest and the Holocaust, the reason why I dealt with those two traumas together, what, which is probably a bad idea, but because the Holocaust is recognized as a, as a major public historical event, but incest is usually thought of as personal and familial. And I, I precisely wanted to be able to talk about the two together since they have all these components. And so I, the border is obviously an example where there is this sociopolitical uh, occurrence of, of massive reach and political formativeness. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but, but then also you have these, these individual experiences that are occurring. Like the woman who found the body of Maricela, this woman is named Olivia Waterhouse. And she was interviewed for the film later at Barnard. So in New York by Joshua Bonetta. She, she describes in her testimony, which I didn't play, what, what she felt like, what it was like when she found the body of Maricela and how they had to create a, a makeshift shade while they were waiting for the border patrol to come and take the body and the, the sensory elements of that experience. And then the experience of, of meeting up with border patrol officers at a later date and how they varied in their response. So there is this sensory and um, expression of personal traumatization in the film, as well as the, the sociopolitical dimensions of trauma. Right. You're right, it's a perfect film for me. Yeah. Janet, would you like a final word? Um, no, the, the only final word I have after so many words is to thank you so much. This was, this was a, yet another fantastic experience for me with your group because the questions have been you know, so informed and so thoughtful. And you know how usually you, you give a talk and there, there's time for one or two rushed questions, but this was so great. And I, if anyone else has any thoughts, feel free to, who didn't have a chance to express it at this moment or who like me think of a question 15 minutes later, in my case, walking to my car, feel free to, feel free to get in touch. But I really want to thank this colloquium, all of you individually, and then the colloquium as a group for being so influential on my work over so many years, and then for yet another amazing experience. And, and, and thank you, because I know the, the material is difficult. You know, the, it's, I mean, not, not, you know, intellectually super weighty, although it's that too, but what I meant is the the issue of the border and these deaths at the border. Yeah, you left us, I think, with so many questions about our political situation, which of course, although we didn't raise it up, I think everybody thinks of, think about it. Well, I would love to, yeah. if there were another colloquium it's, where it's someone, you know, from your group. the question of the border, the question of crossing, the, the rest, the racism, the, you know, all these Israeli issues of the time. So thank you very much for that as well. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Janet. It was fantastic. Good evening. Experience, everybody. Thank you, Janet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.